Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching World Insight with news and analysis. Now let's continue because for much of the past year, the fast growing economies of the emerging world have watched the Western financial hurricane from far, far away. Their own banks held few of the mortgage based assets that undid the rich world's financial firms. Commodity exporters were thriving thanks to high prices for raw materials. And from Budapest to Brasilia, an abundance of credit fueled domestic demand. But in an age of globalization, emerging economies are not immune from the financial storm, as you find out in this story. The Blue Lagoon Spa is just a few kilometers southwest of the Icelandic capital Reykjavik. With Iceland on the verge of national bankruptcy, tourism could become the backbone of this volcanic island's economy. I think actually uh, what we have been seeing here is that we need to have more support uh, for the domestic uh, businesses from the banks and I think that the government now is taking steps to ensure that. The government is struggling to save the country from the collapse of its banking system. The sector benefited from an economic boom in recent years. But the whole system was built on a shaky foundation of foreign debt. That total now tops 100 billion US dollars compared to a national GDP of 14 billion. Last week, Iceland had agreed with the International Monetary Fund on a loan of 2.1 billion US dollars. But Iceland still needs a further 4 billion. And Iceland isn't the only country turning to the IMF. Also on the list are the countries of the emerging world. Last week, the IMF approved a $16.5 billion program for Ukraine. And on Tuesday, the IMF, the European Union and the World Bank agreed to a $25.1 billion US dollar economic rescue package for Hungary to bolster confidence in its economy. With more countries like Pakistan and Belarus in the queue for support, analysts say the emerging world is not far from the center of the storm. Unlike many previous emerging market crises, today's mess spread from the rich world, largely thanks to increasingly integrated capital markets. The emerging world has benefited in the world economic boom in the past. Now when economic depression comes, they of course will be affected, especially for those with an immature financial mechanism. Foreign investors who, over the last four years, fueled the emerging market's boom, are pulling money out to meet redemption at home. This has sent their stock markets and currencies plunging. Those taking the biggest hits in recent weeks are in Asia, Russia and Latin America. Russia is spending 220 billion US dollars to shore up its financial services industry. South Korea has guaranteed 100 billion US dollars of its bank's debt. Less well-endowed countries like Hungary and Ukraine are asking for help. Argentina is nationalizing its private pension funds seemingly to stave off default. The cumulative impact of all this will be enormous. How these countries fare will determine whether the world economy faces a mild recession or something nastier. Emerging economies accounted for around three quarters of global growth over the past 18 months, and it will also determine the political stability in some countries and regions. In some developing countries, the gap between rich and poor is large. The economic crisis may bring some social problems. In the Côte d'Ivoire, the world's top cocoa producer, farmers' livelihoods depend on the ability to sell their cocoa crops. And that ability is in doubt. We are afraid because today the cocoa price is decided by the London Stock Exchange. So if the market drops, people won't be able to get their orders and won't be able to finance their multinational companies to buy the cocoa. So effectively, the ivory and cocoa will be hit. Since the mid-1990s, Africa's impressive growth rates have caused foreign investors and players to view the continent as an attractive last frontier in emerging markets. But now the IMF sees Africa growth dipping to 6%. Analysts say emerging economies should have their voice in the crisis. You 
For the emerging world, they should deal with their domestic financial and social problems first to limit the damage of the global financial crisis. Then they do what they can to help reform the international financial systems. They should ask why their money in the U.S. market has gone. They should speak out their needs in coping with this financial crisis. On October 15th, India, Brazil, and South Africa, all G20 member states, asked which countries to listen to them while deciding how to manage the global financial crisis. Our wise. On how to manage this crisis in a way that does not jeopardize our development priorities needs to be heard in international councils. We need more than ever before a renewed effort to reform the institutions of international governance, whether it is the United Nations or the Group of Eight. At a two-day Asia-Europe meeting in Beijing last week, leaders called for new rules for guiding the global economy. Speaking for the hosts, Premier Wen Jiabao said financial innovation needed to be balanced with regulation and called for measures to reduce the impact of the meltdown on jobs, growth, and trade. And nations would only survive the global economic turmoil by working together. We will we are looking forward to participating in the Global Financial Summit hosted by Washington. We feel that only with countries coming together in a cooperative and open atmosphere will we find new ways to help the global economy. A lot of people in the Senegalese capital Dakar don't have a bank account, a car, or a house of their own, let alone a mortgage. Many haven't even heard of the global financial crisis that's shaken markets, banks, governments, homeowners, and savers. The only crisis they know of is surviving day by day in a country where most people barely earn enough to feed their family or rent a room. But well, in case you're wondering, the crisis isn't about to end any time soon. In fact, its impact is still spreading and deepening. Analysts say we need to look ahead for the future impact, which may go beyond what economists are currently dealing with now. How will issues such as relations between major powers, regional conflicts, the war on terror, and the process of nuclear non-proliferation change in response? We'll be following those events and bringing more analysis. 